Hello. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the general approach to poisonings in the emergency department setting. So what is a poisoning? Briefly, it's any illness that's caused by exposure to a toxic substance. Now, in the emergency department setting, that's most commonly going to be intoxication with recreational drugs or alcohol and overdoses with these same substances. But poisoning also includes occupational and environmental exposures. It includes deliberate self-harm, so suicide attempts with various types of overdoses, accidental ingestions of toxic substances, and even chemical and biological weapon exposures. The incidence of poisoning is unknown, but it's a very, very common cause of ED visits in the United States, and it's something that you'll definitely see in emergency medicine practice anywhere in the world. It's a really important domain of emergency medicine expertise because we are always the first line people who see patients who are exposed to toxic substances, and we really need to know how to manage them. So let's start off with a case. We have a 20-year-old man who is found down in the street. So he's just found unconscious in the street lying there. He's unresponsive on presentation to the ED, and he's got a white powder around his mouth and nose. So that certainly should be making you think about a toxicologic exposure. How are we going to approach the assessment and management of this patient? Well, first and foremost, we're going to start with the ABCs. And the ABCs are important for every patient in emergency medicine, but with uh, poisonings, they're especially important because it's very common um, that patients are obtunded, they're unable to protect their airway, and we really need to think about intubating them in order to, to uh, ensure a patent airway. So anytime the patient has a GCS of less than six, if they've got a lot of pooling of secretions in their uh, mouth or pharynx, if they're vomiting, if they're hypoxic, we really want to think about uh, intubating early. We also want to make sure we support our patient's respiratory status. So generally, um, we want to, at minimum, monitor their oxygen saturation and their end tidal CO2 to make sure they're not just oxygenating, but also ventilating. In addition, we're going to give supplemental oxygen as needed, and if the patient's not oxygenating or ventilating well, we're going to give them respiratory support, which might include non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, it might include bag valve mass ventilation, or again, we might have to go all the way to intubation and mechanical ventilation for respiratory failure. From a circulatory standpoint, there are a number of poisonings that can uh, cause alterations in the heart rate and blood pressure, and we want to make sure that we monitor the patient very carefully. So continuous cardiac monitoring, frequent blood pressure checks, good vascular access, and then for patients who are in shock or hypotensive, we want to make sure that we are um, giving them IV fluids or vasopressor support, and if the um, toxic exposure has caused any kind of cardiac dysrhythmia, we want to make sure we're addressing that as well. Lastly is D, our disability or neurologic assessment. So we want to always check a neurologic primary survey in every patient. That's going to include GCS, pupillary exam, and four extremity movement. And never, ever, ever forget to check a glucose. Any patient with a depressed mental status always needs to be checked for hypoglycemia. All right, well, like I said before, our patient probably has a toxic ingestion given the presence of white powder um, around his nose and face. So as you can see, we have a variety of different uh, agents here that we need to think about in the poisoning of this patient. So if we just know the pharmacology and the pharmacokinetics and all the clinical manifestations of this convenient list of drugs, we should be able to manage them, right? Well, obviously, that's impossible. There's tons of different uh, medications and drugs out in the world that patients can potentially be exposed to, and we clearly can't take a drug-by-drug -drug approach to trying to develop a differential diagnosis in toxicology. So we use something called the toxidromes, which basically are clinical syndromes or groupings of signs and symptoms that are associated with particular classes of toxin. And they're all based on the autonomic effects of the toxin in question. So basically, different drug classes will produce different autonomic effects, and you can examine the patient to identify what toxidrome they might have been um, uh, exposed to. So the assessment of patients is based on readily observable findings. There's uh, examination of the eyes or pupils, examination of the skin, secretions, 
and their vital signs. And basically, by looking at these four things, we can identify what toxidrome applies to our patient and rapidly narrow the differential diagnosis of what substance they might have been exposed to. So the traditional toxidromes include sympathomimetics, anticholinergics, cholinergics, sedative hypnotics, and opioids. However, there are other toxidromes that have been described more recently, including neuroleptic malignant syndrome, serotonin syndrome, et cetera. So uh, the five traditional toxidromes, which is what we're going to focus on today, are not comprehensive and they don't include every possible toxic substance. So let's start off with sympathomimetics. This is a pretty easy one to understand. All the sympathomimetics do is upregulate the sympathetic nervous system. So basically, they increase the heart rate increase the blood pressure, generally produce sinus tachycardia, although in high doses they can also precipitate tachyarrhythmias. They don't do a whole lot to respiration, although some patients may present with tachypnea, and many patients will present with hyperthermia, largely due to the motor activity and agitation associated with uh, sympathomimetic ingestions. When you examine the pupils in these patients, they'll be midriatic, so their pupils will be very large. Their skin may be normal, but diaphoresis is quite common, and their secretions are generally going to be normal. So again, this is a pretty easy toxidrome to understand. It basically involves upregulation of the sympathetic nervous system, fast heart rate, high blood pressure, um, medriasis, but generally not a lot of effects on skin or secretions. By contrast, we have the anticholinergic toxidrome. So as you can imagine, when you block the parasympathetic nervous system, you're going to have unopposed sympathetic innervation. So a lot of the features of the anticholinergic toxidrome are similar to sympathomimetics. You're going to have a fast heart rate, a high blood pressure, a rapid cardiac rhythm, and in some cases you may have tachyarrhythmias. Generally, not a lot of effect on respiration, but very commonly an elevated temperature. This is actually an important feature of anticholinergic toxicity. Much like patients with uh, sympathomimetic uh, exposure, you're going to have medriasis, so large pupils. However, this is where it gets different. So these patients lose cholinergic innervation to the skin and the mucosa, so they're going to have dry skin. And more importantly, they're going to have almost no secretion. So they're going to have a dry mouth. They're going to have no tears. They're going to appear clinically uh, to be very dehydrated. So there's a mnemonic for the anticholinergic toxidrome. toxidrome. It's mad as a hatter, because these patients will all have altered mental status and agitation. Blind as a bat, which refers to the very dilated pupils. Red as a beet which refers to the skin flushing that you commonly see in patients with anticholinergic ingestions. Hot as a hair, and I'm not really sure why hairs are so hot, but this refers to the dry skin and the elevated body temperature. And then lastly, dry as a bone. So these patients will have dry mucous membranes um, and a lack of uh, oral and ocular secretions. Now, it might not surprise you to hear that the cholinergic toxidrome is pretty much the opposite of the anticholinergic toxidrome. So these patients will have a slow heart rate, a normal to low blood pressure. They'll typically be in sinus bradycardia. Arrhythmias are very unusual with this toxidrome. They're going to have some degree of respiratory depression, typically a pretty normal temperature, although they might be on the low side. And their pupils are going to be meiotic, so their pupils will be constricted, small. So this is a really important differentiating feature of the cholinergic toxidromes. These patients will be wet, so their skin will be profusely diaphoretic, and their secretions will be copious. You'll see lots and lots of secretions in the mouth. You'll see lots of tearing. And that's because that's what the parasympathetic nervous system does. It basically innervates all of the parts of the body uh, that produce secretions. And you can easily remember the cholinergic toxidrome by thinking about fluids pouring out of every orifice. So there's a mnemonic for the cholinergic toxidrome that includes salivation, copious oral secretions, lacrimation, copious tearing, urination, these patients will commonly be incontinent of urine, defecation or diarrhea, and unfortunately that's an area where they're often incontinent as well,
GI dysmotility, and emesis. So basically, you can imagine there's something or other pouring out of every orifice in this patient. There's another mnemonic, um, which some people prefer, that is, includes diarrhea, urination, meiosis or muscle weakness, bronchorrhea, bradycardia, emesis, lacrimation, and salivation. Now, whether or not you use these mnemonics or however you think of the anticholinergic toxidrome, an easy way to remember it, again, is if they have copious secretions, if there's fluid pouring out of every orifice, you want to be thinking about the cholinergics. All right, the sedative hypnotics are pretty easy to understand because what they do is cause sedation. Um, so somnolence is going to be the primary hallmark. These patients sometimes can be so deeply sedated that they lose their airway protective reflexes, so you do need to consider the possibility of intubation in some cases. And respiratory depression might also occur, so sometimes these patients require mechanical ventilation. There's not a lot of autonomic effects associated with the uh, sedative hypnotics, but remember, patients often take multiple drugs at the same time, so they may have autonomic uh, effects related to co-ingestions or other things that they took along with their sedative uh, ingestion. Opioids are very similar to the sedative hypnotics in that they produce somnolence, however, um, they universally produce meiosis. So opioids are a very powerful pupillary constrictor. And when you see pinpoint or very constricted pupils, you should always think about opioids. The other thing to remember about opioids is that uh, they very commonly cause respiratory depression. Um, so patients can come in apneic or with respiratory rates that are significantly low, and this can be a fatal event. So for these patients, we need to be pretty aggressive about treating them and restoring their normal respiration in order to save their lives. All right, so here's a review of the toxidromes, and I'm going to highlight some of the things that differentiate them so you can remember. Sympathomimetics, these patients will present hypertensive and tachycardic, and typically their mental status will be agitated. Anticholinergic patients will look a lot like sympathomimetic patients, except they will have very dry skin, very dry secretions. By contrast, our cholinergic patients will be copiously wet. They'll have diaphoretic skin, they'll have um, uh, increased secretions, and they typically will be somnolent rather than agitated. Our sedative hypnotic patients will, of course, be sedated. And our opioid patients will also be sedated. However, they'll present with meiosis and respiratory depression. So hopefully this will help you keep different clinical syndromes associated with different classes of drugs straight and allow you to rapidly narrow your toxicologic differential when you're faced with a patient who has an exposure. All right, so what we're going to do now is shift gears to a couple of cases, and we're going to talk through how these uh, patients present in real life. So we're going to start off with a 22-year-old man. He was, like his prior colleague, found down in a shed at work. Um, he works as a landscaper. He had white powder on his face and clothing. You can see his vital signs here. His uh, temperature is a bit low. His heart rate's 55, which is low. He's a bit tachypnic, stable blood pressure, and significant hypoxia. When you listen to him, his respirations are making a gurgling sound, and you look in his mouth, he's got pooled secretions in his oropharynx. His pupils are only two millimeters. His skin is cool and diaphoretic. And during the exam, he begins vomiting. So what are we thinking about for this patient? So the easiest way to think about it is if you've got bodily fluids everywhere, you should you should definitely be considering cholinergics. So this gentleman has copious oral secretions. He's vomiting. Um, his skin is diaphoretic. This is somebody you want to think about a cholinergic ingestion. And in fact, most exposures are from uh, organophosphates, which are used as pesticides. So the fact that this gentleman works as a landscaper should further raise your suspicion. As far as the management for this guy goes, I can't overemphasize this enough. You have to decontaminate him. And that is A, to prevent further exposure for him, and B, to prevent you and your staff from being exposed and getting sick as well. So you've got to decontaminate the patient, remove the clothing, clean the powder off of the skin, make sure that you, um, that you get rid of all of the toxin before you proceed with other interventions.
These patients are definitely going to need to be intubated early. They will literally drown in their own secretions. So management of the airway is absolutely critical. And they typically need high flow oxygen or positive pressure ventilation in order to oxygenate adequately. As far as antidotes go, um, atropine is the antidote of choice. It restores the normal cholinergic tone, and it would be indicated in this case. And you can also use pralidoxime or 2-PAM, uh, which reactivates the acetylcholinesterase that has been deactivated by the toxin. All right, let's move on to another case. So here we have another patient who's found down, and this is a common presentation in toxic exposures. This one is a 38-year-old woman who was found unresponsive in her bedroom by family. There were empty pill bottles next to her bed, but the family didn't bring them with her. Her vital signs are as you see them. So she has a normal temperature, normal heart rate, but a respiratory rate of 4 and an oxygen saturation of only 81%. Her pupils are 1 millimeter, and her skin is cyanotic but dry. So what are we thinking about with this patient? Again, this is a pretty classic presentation, and hopefully you've recognized this as an opioid overdose. So this is an unfortunately very common presentation that we see um, in urban areas in the United States, um, and it's something that uh, has caused a lot of deaths in recent years and is actually increasing in terms of the frequency um, and mortality associated with these events. So anytime you see a patient who presents with pinpoint pupils, and respiratory depression. You, can, you should definitely have opioids at the top of your differential. These exposures can be recreational, so patients uh, who use opioids recreationally, like heroin or oxycodone, um, they may just overdo it and inadvertently overdose themselves, but they can also represent attempted suicide, and you need to consider that possibility in every overdose patient. The initial management really consists of supporting the patient's respiration. So if the patient is apneic or breathing so slowly that their respiration is inadequate for oxygenation, you want to initiate bag valve mask ventilation right away. Now, if you're not able uh, to bag them effectively or if they don't respond rapidly to your more definitive treatment, you might need to intubate them. But the good news is we have a rapidly acting antidote for opioid overdose, so usually you can bag the patient long enough to get them breathing again and you shouldn't need to intubate. We definitely want to make sure that we're giving them high flow oxygen and restoring their normal oxygenation. I mentioned the antidote, and that's naloxone. So it's an opioid receptor antagonist that very rapidly reverses the effects of opioids. Basically, naloxone will bind to the receptors and block the opioids from exerting uh, influence at the cellular level. The dose of naloxone that you need for a given overdose patient is highly variable. It really depends on how much of the opioid they took. Um, so we're going to titrate our naloxone to effect. If a small dose doesn't do it, consider a larger dose. And if that dose doesn't do it, consider a second dose. You really want to make sure that you are maximizing uh, your treatment in order to get the desired effect. So there's no one-size-fits-all formula for dosing. All right, moving on to yet another case. This one is a 44-year-old man with a history of depression. He's found at home by family with altered mental status. There are a number of empty pill bottles in the trash can. They're all over-the-counter pill bottles. The patient is alert, but he's agitated and combative. You can see his vital signs here. He's got a temperature of 38.5, a heart rate of 135, um, respirations of 24, blood pressure of 160 over 98, and his saturation is normal. His pupils are 8 millimeters. His skin is flushed and dry, and he's got dry mucous membranes. So this is a gentleman who is febrile, tachycardic, tachypnic, with hot, dry skin and medriasis. Hopefully, you recognize this as an anticholinergic case. So he is mad as a hatter in that his mental status is altered, blind as a bat because he's midriatic, red as a beet because he's flushed, hot as a hare because he's literally hot, and dry as a bone because his mucous membranes are dry. So this is very suggestive of anticholinergic poisoning. The key thing you want to do anytime a patient comes in having taken pills is find out what they took. So in his case, we're going to probably deploy the family to go back home and bring us in these empty pill bottles. 
We're also going to sedate the patient as needed to ensure their safety and the safety of our staff. A patient who's agitated and combative is not going to be easy to care for in the ED, and we want to make sure that their behavior doesn't interfere with their appropriate medical care. We're also going to give IV fluids to restore intravascular volume as needed. There is an antidote for anticholinergic poisoning. It's physostigmine, which is an um, acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. However, we don't really give this routinely. Um, and for most ingestions in the emergency department, um, we're able to just take care of the patient with supportive care and let the anticholinergic medicine wear off. However, if the patient does have persistent dysrhythmias, seizures, severe psychosis, you can consider use of physostigmine uh, to treat that patient as an adjunct to their other supportive care. Now, there's a lot of common anticholinergics, you know, and there's a number of over-the-counter and prescription medications that have very powerful anticholinergic effects that you should be aware of. So antihistamines, antiemetics, antipsychotics, antispasmodics like dicyclamine, motion sickness remedies, muscle relaxers, and tricyclic antidepressants all have significant anticholinergic effects. And if they're taken in doses that are higher than that which is intended, um, they can produce anticholinergic toxicity. So in fact, for our patient, the family brought us the pill bottles and we discovered that he took a full bottle of Tylenol PM, which consists of um, acetaminophen 325 milligrams plus diphenhydramine 25 milligrams. It was a 100 pill bottle, which is now empty, giving him a total ingestion of more than 30 grams of acetaminophen and two and a half grams of diphenhydramine. That is definitely enough to give him significant anticholinergic toxicity. But in addition to the anticholinergic syndrome, which is what brought him to our attention, we have to be concerned about his co-ingestion, which is the Tylenol. So Tylenol is one of our high toxicity ingestions. And any time you have a patient who presents with a poisoning that has high lethality potential, you always want to involve um, a, either your local poison center or a toxicologist to get guidance on how to manage them. We don't routinely perform GI decontamination in patients with toxic ingestions anymore. But for high toxicity ingestions that have occurred within the past few hours, you might consider nasogastric lavage to get any pills or pill fragments out of the stomach. You might consider activated charcoal in order to hopefully bind the toxin in question and get it out of the system through the GI tract. Or you might consider whole bowel irrigation, again, for patients who potentially have intact pills that you want to um, flush out the other end. You also, of course, want to optimize your supportive care. And if there is an available antidote for the ingestion in question, you want to administer it promptly. Now, anytime we think about GI decontamination, I want to emphasize that we should be weighing the potential benefit against the risk. So there's always a risk of aspiration in a patient with altered mental status if we start putting things into their GI tract. So if it's a really high lethality ingestion and you want to decontaminate them, you should consider protecting their airway as well if they're not sufficiently alert to protect it on their own. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about acetaminophen overdose, um, which is actually a, a common and disturbing problem in the United States. Um, acetaminophen is also known as paracetamol in other settings. Um, and it's a readily available over-the-counter drug that has high lethality potential and produces very minimum, minimal symptoms, at least in the initial phase. So the way acetaminophen works, um, or the way that toxicity works, I should say, is that the liver metabolizes the acetaminophen into a compound called NAPQI, which is highly toxic. Now, in normal doses of acetaminophen, your NAPQI is combined uh, in the body with thiols, that produces a non-toxic metabolite, which is then eliminated. However, in overdoses, your thiol stores are depleted and the toxic uh, metabolite accumulates. Now, the main effect of acetaminophen is liver injury. So in high doses, acetaminophen can actually cause fulminant liver failure, and it's one of the leading causes of liver transplantation in young people. The antidote for this is called NAC, or N-acetylcysteine. And basically what it does is it detoxifies NAPQI and decreases the production of it. 
It's a very, very effective antidote, but it has to be given early. It should be initiated within eight hours of the ingestion. So this is very important. You can't wait around to see if the patient is going to have manifestations of liver failure. You need to initiate treatment based on your clinical suspicion. So there's a nomogram that helps guide our decision about whether to give uh, NAC to patients with acetaminophen overdoses. Note that the nomogram doesn't start until four hours after the ingestion. So it takes four hours for GI absorption to be complete, um, meaning we don't check a level until four hours after the ingestion. After that point, depending on what level we get, we can differentiate between high risk of toxicity and low risk of toxicity. And if the patient is above that thresh threshold for toxicity, we want to go ahead and treat them. All right. So obviously, I couldn't cover every possible poisoning. So I tried to give you some essential principles. Um, it's really important to know your toxidromes so that you can recognize what drug class your patient might have been exposed to and narrow your differential diagnosis. Otherwise, you're going to be left trying to figure out the individual properties of lots of different drugs, which is not really realistic. You want to make sure you externally decontaminate your patient in order to protect both yourself and them. You want to provide aggressive supportive care with a real focus on the ABCs. You want to recognize any potential high toxicity or high lethality ingestions and get help. You want to consider GI decontamination, especially in patients with a high risk of morbidity or mortality from their toxic ingestion. But remember to always protect their airway when you do that. And then you want to be aware of antidotes and use them when they're available and indicated.